Good afternoon. I'm Jeff Cook. I'm the chairman of the Tennessee Fish and Wildlife Commission. I'd like to welcome everyone to our to our uh, August commission meeting. Today's our committee day, and tomorrow will be our full commission day. I know we have a lot of folks, a lot of excited folks, both in the state and around the country, waiting for a big announcement and see who our winners here in the next few minutes. So, in order to not drag this out, let's get this going. So, Danette, would you please call the roll? Chad Baker. Angie Box, Here. Bill Cox, Here. Dennis Gardner, Here. Connie King, Here. Tony Sanders, Here. James Stroud, Here. Brian, uh, Bill Swan, Here. Kent Woods, Here. Here. Jamie Woodson, Here. Brian McLaren, Here. Kurt Holbert, Here. Jeff Cook. Here. Chairman, we have a quorum. Well, thank you, Danette. And first, I'd like to thank uh, Commissioner Holbert for just promoting the idea of the elk raffle. It's been a, a great success. And also like to commend uh, Commissioners uh, Baker and Cox for their ideas in promoting the increase in both the uh, archery and the elk tag. So, uh, and, the, and the full commission too for supporting and voting on that. Also like to uh, commend Brad Miller for all his work. He's the elk coordinator and his staff at TWRA, all the hard, hard work they've done to for both the elk herd and, and this program. Uh, I'd like to thank the Tennessee Wildlife Resource Foundation for running the raffle and helping us with that. So I know there's a lot of excited people and uh, we'll, I'll turn this over. I'll, I'll also like to say too, this is a huge benefit to the sportsmen as well as the elk. All this money will go toward uh, restoration of uh, habitat and that will just help the herd even more. So, so good luck to everybody. If you don't win this year, uh, we'll be doing it again next year. So, so I'd like to turn this over to uh, Commissioner Holbert, who's chairman of the Wildlife Committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Without further delay, Mr. Brad Miller. Afternoon, everyone. So a very exciting day. I know there's a lot of people uh, online eager to learn if their name's gonna be drawn. And we have 15 uh, winners, and I'm gonna announce 14 of the 15. Um, the raffle tag, again, which is new for this year, will be uh, announced um, in the next presentation. So again, without further ado, we have seven archery tags, we have one young sportsman tag, and then we have seven of the uh, gun, muzzleloader, or archery tags. One of those is the raffle tag. So to begin with, I'd like to uh, recognize Daryl Beeler with an archery tag out of Corrington, Luke Dunham, Cookville, Charles Hall, Chattanooga, Mason King in Harriman, Adam Miller in Jamestown, Hunter Monk in Cleveland and Marcus Tilson from Oakdale. So moving on to the gun, Gary Bivens of Teleco Plains, Henry Cothran of Bethpage, Taylor Moody, Knoxville, Denise Potter, Maryville, David Pruitt, Jackson, Tennessee, Mark Vines, Jonesboro, and then our young sportsman, Porter Newbauer of Belvedere. So congratulations to everyone. Um, I'll be reaching out to each one of these um, in the next 24 hours or so to, uh, if they haven't already heard, to uh, give them the good news. That's all I have. And the elk rifle permit winner is, is gonna be announced next. Thanks, Brad, very much. I'd like to call on uh, Mr. Joy Woodard. Tennessee Wildlife Resources Foundation. Thank you. I'm happy to be here today, and we're all excited about the uh, results for the uh, elk raffle permit winner. This uh, 
this year. She's got a quick presentation. Of course, we're, we're also going out Facebook Live with this, so that adds a little bit more excitement to it. Um, so this was our first year. We did something a little bit different this year. We decided to raffle this tag. In previous years, uh, that tag has been auctioned at eBay. Uh, some years, we uh, I think the first year, it auctioned for over $17,000, uh, but it's ranged and fluctuated in, in, uh, in, in different years from eight to, to $12,000 typically. So we kind of took a gamble this year and wanted to raffle that tag to see if we could generate more funds, and, and it, was a, it was a big success. Um, the, the key to that success was the focused marketing campaign that we did. Um, the, the key to that was sending uh, direct emails out to all license holders, the sportsman's uh, license and big game license holders. So we're getting those email marketing campaigns right out to the, the people that we know are interested uh, in big game hunting. Uh, there was also a, a social media uh, campaign associated with that. And we had lots of partners, and I want to list some of those partners today as well. Uh, I'd like to thank Realtree and Smoky Mountain Knife Works, NRA through American Hunter, uh, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, uh, Safari Club International, the Tennessee Wildlife Federation, Tennessee Outdoor News, and a uh, special thank you to Richard Sims in Chattanooga. Um, wildly successful, we sold 22,482 <laughs> tickets, um, and that's $224,820 worth of revenue uh, for that. Here's some of the analytics. I apologize, these aren't the best graphics, but this come off our Google Analytics for the, for the campaign, but you can see Pretty good coverage across the state of Tennessee uh, with this. We've got good coverage. You can see the metropolitan areas, Nashville, obviously the, the size and, and color of the dot indicates the intensity. Uh, but you've got Nashville, Knoxville, Maryville, Chattanooga, and Memphis. Uh, but good coverage statewide uh, and even outside of Tennessee. If it will advance. help thank you um, so 76 countries um, servers from 76 countries uh, came to our website to look at these tags. now I don't know how many of those were legitimate people looking for elk tag or how many of them might have been Russian bots but 76 <laughs> 76 different countries uh, visited visit our website uh, here's a breakdown of the states uh, by rank uh, obviously Tennessee was far and away um, the state with the most clicks uh, Georgia was a, a, close, uh, a second and, and far ahead of the other states, and a little bit more on that later. Uh, but that was some interesting uh, statistics uh, breakdown from that. Here's some, of the, some additional analytics that, that uh, kind of back up what I said earlier. I apologize, some of the resolution on this is not great. Uh, but looking at top channels, email, 37.7% of all hits came from uh, email. 24.2% were the organic search uh, and direct at 21.2%. Uh, and then referrals, they came from another website or some of our partners may have uh, sent that out. And then social media and other sources. Uh, this was interesting if you look at the bottom, uh, the bottom uh, image there. This is uh, an analytic showing the devices. 51% um, or 54%, excuse me, 54% of the people that bought tickets bought it on their mobile phone. So that's important in this digital age to know how you're marketing, who you're marketing to. I think that was one of our keys to success was making this so easy. It's real simple. You click a button and you go right to the site and you're purchasing a ticket. 39% um, with desktop and the remainder with tablet. Uh, top sources, again, 37.4%. That's the gov delivery and that's direct uh, marketing to license holders. Um, second was Google and then direct. Uh, then um, other, I guess that's 8% eight, eight a little over 8% of the people found their way to this help tag raffle through our website. This was probably the most interesting. Uh, we knew that the focused marketing campaign to the license uh, holders were, was gonna be the most effective. And this bears out exactly what we kind of expected to see. You'll see there are five spikes in this chart. And those five spikes correspond to the five different emails that were sent out uh, asking people to buy raffle tickets. The first spike, the highest, that was the most interest. And then as you go down, you see the spikes start to decrease in intensity until the last one. And that's for all the procrastinators that kept saying, oh yeah, I'll get to that. And then when we finally sent one out with one day left, they came in and, and bought tickets. So uh, really successful. I think we learned a lot this year. Uh, really changed the game on, on how much uh, money we were able to make on that tag. I think it's a really wise use of our resources. Uh, tell you a little bit about our drawing process. 
Each ticket that was sold was assigned a unique identification number. Uh, the customer's name, phone number, and email was attached to each one of those records. Uh, TWA was also, uh, you were also able to purchase these tickets from TWA's website through the real system. And so what we did is we combined that data. TWA sent us their records. We combined all that into one master spreadsheet. Uh, the winning number was selected using a random function number in Excel, and uh, the process worked flawlessly, just like it should. So we were we were uh, excited about that, and uh, so we're Facebook Live. We're we're streaming out there with this, and I'm fixing to announce the winner, and we'll see how this works out. But I've also got his phone number in my phone, so I'm going to try to call him and just see if there's a chance that maybe he's watching. Uh, but without further ado, Scott Thomas. Uh, from Cleveland, Tennessee, is the uh, is the winner of this year's elk tag raffle, and I'm going to dial his number right here and see if we're lucky enough for an answer. All right, nothing like a good internet fail. Went straight to voicemail. <laughs> so um, we tried, we tried. So, um, but I will be contacting. I will reach out to Scott later today. Uh, talk to him about the specifics. Uh, he not only won the the 2018 elk tag. Uh, but he also uh, he also won a rifle and scope uh, combo that Bass Pro Shops was generous enough to uh, to donate for. So we we kind of sweetened the pot with that, um, and uh, so it's a pretty good package. Scott is calling me back. Look at that. <laughs> hey, is this Scott? Uh, this is Joey Woodard with the TWR effort. You happen do you happen to be watching this on Facebook Live? Well, you are the winner. Congratulations. <laughs> so and you saved me from an internet fail. So, uh, so on behalf of the, the foundation, TWA, and the commission, I'd just like to uh, congratulate you on your win. And we're here in a commission meeting. I'm holding up the rest of the meeting, so I'll, I'll let you go, but I'll call you back uh, here uh, when we get out of this meeting, and we'll talk to you about the details. All right. Oh, hey, Scott, we've got a question from the commissioner. Can you tell me how many tickets you bought? Two. You bought two tickets. Double your chances. All right. Smart play, Scott. Well done. All right, so we pulled that out. So, uh, so that's that's all I have to report on. Um, maybe one more slide there. Sums up everybody. <coughs> Any questions? I'm happy to answer. He was. He was. <laughs> and the, I'm sorry. Yeah, there was a conversation going on that you were only catching one side of. But he he was watching live, and and that's why he called. That's probably why he went to voicemail. He was he was engaged, <laughs> but he, he decided to call us back. So, all right. Thank you. I would also like this is working. I'd also like to thank Mike Butler. Mike, I'm sorry. You you've been in the elk program from the very beginning and I meant to mention you and thank you for your involvement. I forgot the the Tennessee Wildlife Federation has been deeply involved in this and greatly appreciate all your support. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to thank Commissioner Holbert for the great idea. I know it's something that was supported unanimously by commission, but sometimes it takes the great idea and the willingness to keep talking about it, troubleshooting issues, and keep pushing it forward. And I just really appreciate Commissioner Holbert's leadership on this. That's a, And for those who are unaware, the, the resources will now go to support elk habitat. And that's a win for everybody not only the sportsmen but also for the resource and for uh, you know generations behind us so thank you Commissioner thank you Commissioner Woodson anybody else <coughs> thanks Joey wherever you went disappeared all right um, just a just a moment I'd, I would like to thank director Carter and uh, Chris Richardson I know you had a big part in this getting it getting it done um, Commissioner Woodson, you were the chairman when this all started. Um, I would like to mention uh, a guy that's not on here anymore, but David Watson uh, had a, uh, definitely supported this. But I had both of your support uh, for that, and I just want to appreciate tell you thank you. So anyway, thank you, Director Carter and Chris, for, for all you did. You got anything, Director Carter? All right. Um, um, Two hundred twenty-four thousand and eight hundred dollars. You're welcome. I don't know if it was up there. I'm not going to say it was. I mean. <laughs> don't 
tell me who they are. I know. <laughs> All right. Next, I'm going to call on Bobby Wilson. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I'm here today to introduce the the wildlife veterinarian that is now part of TWA. I wanted to uh, give you a little background in it for for many years. Now we've recognized a need for the services of a veterinarian to help us with our a lot of wildlife issues. And a couple of years ago, we spoke and met with University of Tennessee, specifically the UT Extension Service, but they also had a need for a wildlife veterinarian. So we, uh, we, t we talked and uh, decided to partner with them for this veterinarian. So we did that. We finally did it. It took a while to get done, but we finally did it. <clears throat> and in a minute, I'm going to tell you who he is, but just let you know some of the responsibilities so you know about the justification. Just one second, sorry. Make sure this isn't what's causing it. Thank you, Jason. <laughs> That's why I didn't see that. <laughs> see the at, least, at least Scott heard that he was the winner. That's what <laughs> So anyway, some of the responsibilities are development of wildlife disease plans, programs, and protocols like risk assessment, surveillance, monitoring, and response activities for diseases like <coughs> chronic wasting disease for EHD, for pseudorabies, uh, white nose syndrome, and others. Also, we'll be a coordinator with federal and state disease eradication officials like uh, Department of Agriculture and, and USDA, the APHIS folks. Internal ex external communication, somebody that can know the language better than some of us can and talk to the newspaper and people and web publications that, regarding wildlife diseases. Also be able to, to conduct wildlife necropsy. Somebody, we haven't been able to do that to determine the cause of some of the diseases. Provide technical assistance and training to county extension agents, uh, guidance to agents as needed for responding to field investigation of potential wildlife diseases and collecting samples to monitor the existence and or prevalence of other wildlife diseases. And also would defend the agency position on other disease matters, uh, such as, for a good example, is a chronic waste disease, carcass importation restriction, and things like that. So we finally hired somebody, and uh, it's Dr. Dan Groves. And a little bit about Dan, he's uh, from Knoxville. He's a uh, native Tennessean, pretty much. And uh, he attended UT Knoxville, where he got his undergraduate degree in animal science. And he completed his veterinary medicine degree at UT as well. But after graduation, he completed an internship in large animal medicine and surgery at the University of Georgia, followed that up with an internship in wildlife and conservation medicine at the Wildlife Center of Virginia, did that for two years, he then served as a field veterinarian on deer sterilization and reproduction project in northern Illinois, followed that up by working on a CWD, CWD project in Colorado in the Rocky Mountain National Park as part of a test and cull research project. From Colorado, he went to Wisconsin to work on another CWD project in their core uh, CWD, chronic wasting disease zone, for three years. After that, he became the staff veterinarian at Cape Wildlife Center on Cape Cod in Massachusetts. And in 2008, he became the wildlife veterinarian for the North Dakota Game and Fish Department, where he served in that role for almost 10 years, dealing with everything from developing a wildlife health program to finding and managing chronic wasting disease, avian influenza, bovine tuberculosis, translocation and reintroduction of threatened species, and on and on and on. At this point, Director Carter will probably say, sounds like he has a hard time keeping down a job. <clears throat> but anyway, uh, he's, we got him. We're fortunate, fortunate enough to get him, and uh, he's, he's excited to be back in the South. And his parents and his sister, and I think her family live in Knoxville, and he's got a brother in Raleigh. And uh, so it wasn't that hard, hard of a decision for him to move back to Tennessee. So. He is, and we are excited about the potential that is available with this new position and assisting the growth of the wildlife health program here in Tennessee. So I want to introduce Dr. Dan Groves. Keep this short. Uh, just appreciate the commission supporting the position and uh, recognizing the need for uh, more specialization in wildlife health and what the impacts on wildlife uh, and Tennessee as well as the resource to, to the 
hunting public and the general public. Um, and so I just appreciate the opportunity to be able to uh, help you guys out and do what we see what we can do. So thanks. Thank you, Dr. Grove. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, that concludes the business of the Wildlife Committee. Thank you, Chairman Holbert. I'd like to recognize Tracy Boyers for the next presentation. Thank you, Chairman. <coughs> Today I'm very pleased to introduce y'all to the newest attorney in TWA, Thomas Moncrief. Thomas is a lifelong resident of Tennessee. He grew up in Goodlettsville. He attended UT Knoxville for his undergraduate and he received his law degree at the University of Memphis. For the past six years, Thomas has worked in the legislature as a fiscal analyst dealing with pending legislation, drafting fiscal notes, and providing legal counsel to various of the legislative committees. I managed to lure him away from that very glamorous, very exciting job by promising him that I would give him all the legal issues in real foot. <laughs> <laughs> so in addition to real foot, he will be working on issues and questions regarding our contracts. He's going to be working with personnel on drafting rules, regs, procs. Um, he's going to be assisting Chris with tracking legislation because he's got really good experience in that and he's going to be helping with some HR personnel actions. And on a, a personal note, out of we had over 50 applicants for this job. And of all those applicants, Thomas is the only one that said he engaged in hunting and fishing. And it's my understanding he's an avid duck hunter, so I think that's why Real Foot is really exciting. <laughs> so, Thomas, if you'd stand up, please. Same thing? <coughs> Y'all be nice to him so he doesn't leave, okay? Thank you, Tracy. Well, you didn't run out the door when you mentioned Real Foot, so that's a good sign. So, <laughs> so good. So, all right, we'd like to recognize Chairman Woodson for the Fisheries Committee. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to recognize Chief Fiss. Thank you, Madam Chairman, Commissioners. I'll set this down. So today is the, the, I'm going to have four presentations on our upcoming proclamations in September. The purpose of today's committee meeting is so that we can share this information with the commission and the public in advance of the more, uh, more formal vote taking, you know, voting process on these proclamations in September. So we, we receive public comments throughout the year. And we also solicit comments in April. And we received several of those this year, like we do, about 45 or so. There were no real burning issues that we felt we had to address this year. But we always appreciate getting public comment. And we hope that people will write in between now and September 14th about the, the presentations they're about to hear. And we also sent the, the April information to the commission sometime in June. I, I believe I forwarded those on to the full, at least the fisheries committee. So the first, in, in the sport fishing proclamation, the first change we want to make is to, is to adopt North Carolina's regulations on Calderwood Reservoir. Calderwood is a reservoir where we have a reciprocal agreement. People that go there, most of the people are catching trout. 90% of what's going on there is trout fishing. There's a few people catching yellow perch. But there's other fish that people could encounter while they're there or might think they're going to encounter or think they've encountered in some cases. So the, we're not managing for those species, so it really doesn't matter to us as much as it would in other water bodies. So we've agreed to adopt North Carolina's regs instead of keeping our regs for those species. And you might recall last year or the year before, North Carolina was kind enough to amend their their regulations to allow our fishermen to fish from the bank in North Carolina. So it's kind of have a, a, a good relationship there and we, and we want to keep that. So to make this these regulations the same, here's what the current regulations are. I, again, these ones that are in pink up at the top are the most important regulations. We're pretty close on those now. Seven, seven trout creel limit, no limits on perch and sunfish. The only difference there is that we allow only two lake trout per day. I'll say that we don't really manage Calderwood Reservoir annually for lake trout. We stock them there sometimes. It's been a while. So that's less of an issue to us. The rest of these regulations are for species that, while they're very important in other water bodies, they're not as important in, 
Calderwood because it's just not that kind of fishery. So you'll see that the, the, the difference between the two regulations, we are simply recommending that Tennessee adopt all of North Carolina's regulations for, for those species. The, uh, what, what that change would look like is we have the current Tennessee regulations on the left and the new regulations would be on the right. I would, the whole purpose of this isn't to manage those species uh, any more intensively or differently. It's just to simplify the regulations there. And we did have some public comments requesting this. So we're, we're happy to do this. The next regulation change we'd like to consider is on Watts Bar Reservoir, particularly below Fort Loudon Dam. You may recall a couple of years ago, we had a problem with over harvest, illegal use of sale of fish that were there. It's got a fish in a barrel situation where these paddlefish are highly vulnerable to snagging. We were having a, a hard time keeping it really under control. So we, we, we changed, the, the commission changed the regulation from two fish per day to one fish per day to help in that effort. And that really hasn't solved the problem. We still have a lot of activity there that we'd like to curtail. We are making the recommendation that we change the season here to shorten it up to a two-week season, essentially, to provide more protection for the fish and a, a more focused opportunity for our enforcement officers to work. They know that they've got a, a shorter window to cover on, on this fishery. The other issue that's been going on has been a lot of fish are getting gaffed, and they're, they're basically getting, some of these fish are getting killed while they're being gaffed, and then they're it's catch and release gaffing, and that's killing fish. So we, we would like to remove, make it clear in our, our proclamation that any gaffed fish in Tennessee counts towards your creel. You can't just release that one later. Even if you were another species where you could cull fish, you couldn't cull those fish if you would gaff them. So we'd like you to consider that. In addition to this shortened season, we'd like, there, we'd like to request a, a closed snagging season before and after. We did this on, on Cherokee last year, you might recall. This makes it, and it would only be affect this short area about 0.4 miles from the dam downstream to the 321 bridge. What this does is it, it makes it clear that nobody should be in there snagging leading up to the season so there wouldn't be any poaching early and and or, or late, it would be very easy for our officers to enforce a no snagging rule in this, this little zone. So these shoulder seasons of, uh, from March 15 to April 30, and then May 16 to May 31, uh, eliminates snagging just in that area. You could go downstream in a boat and, and do whatever at that time, but the only pertain to this area where we have uh, not, not only paddlefish, but other sport fish or actual sport fish in, and, and sturgeon that are vulnerable to snagging in this area. Well, the next series of changes we're requesting will involve the Teleco River area. And I, I want to give a little history on what we have there in Teleco River. I'll start off with the delayed harvest season, which starts in October and runs to March 14th. This is a fishery where we stock very few fish, maybe 2,000 fish all winter but there's no harvest allowed. So these fish are recycled throughout the whole winter. It's relatively popular considering the time of year it is. And we don't require them to have the special teleco permit during this time. And it's open to fishing all week long. In, con in contrast, come March 15th every year through September 15th, we have a, a, the, the most intensively managed stock trout fishery in the state. We put uh, close to 2,000 fish in each week People are required to have the Teleco Citico permit, and we have to close the fishery down on Thursdays and Fridays just to have room to drive the hatchery truck and stock the 150 some locations where they put fish in each pool. This, is, this history and tradition has been going on for decades. So this is a very popular fishery. We sell, I think it's about $70,000 worth of, of just these one day permits. And of course there are people there that don't need permits as well. So, but this is the fishery that we're having problems managing. It's, it's getting drier and hotter in the, tennis, in, the, uh, in the Teleco Valley. And this has been a, a, a long time coming, but it is here. The, uh, the, ha the former hatchery manager and now manager of the Teleco River, Travis Scott, looked at the flow data available since 1925. And he was looking at all the, the, the likelihoods of having really low hot water conditions. And the likelihood of having low flow 
in the summer, in the late summer, has, has doubled in the last <coughs> 20 years as compared to what it was in the previous record. And this picture here shows you one of our raceways. That, that hatchery receives water from the Telco River and another tributary up there. So th that raceway is not supposed to be that low. We're, we're, we're just barely hanging on that time of year raising trout. So it makes it even harder to take stressed trout out of a hatchery and stock them into a river that's low and hot. Trout don't like that. They die. So we don't do it. And, or, or we'll shrink the, the area of river that we stock. But the, the public doesn't know that unless they know to call the hatchery and see if we stocked and where we stocked. But at the same time, they could easily go out and buy this permit and not know that we're not stocking. We tried to work through Brant to get them to not sell on days when we knew we weren't stocking, but the best they could do is put a banner on that to say, we're not stocking today if you buy this. We don't like that solution. We think it's more appropriate to change the, uh, change the season. We're, we want to move it back a month so we don't try to manage for trout in a hot environment and then we would move it back two weeks to start this intensive season. So we would essentially, we'd have a net loss of two weeks. But what I, when we looked into the, the, the sales data, you'll see that those last two weeks of the year, we have relatively poor sales anyway, and we always have really good sales in March, early April. So I think we're actually gonna make a little money on this, but that's, that's not why we're doing it, but we don't expect this to be a revenue loss as a decision. So it, we, it, we really feel that we cannot manage that fishery in between August 15 and September 15. So with that change, we don't want the delayed harvest season to overlap the uh, permit season, if you will. So that moves the delayed harvest season back two weeks. And we, we can't move the, the beginning of the delayed harvest season back before October because it's too hot. So this is where we, we feel like we've got a good balance and we can provide a quality fishery to everyone involved. The next area up in the Teleco Valley is Green Cove Pond. This one is, is stocked all year long. It is also closed to fishing on Thursdays and Fridays. And it's, it's a pond that's only open to people under 13, over 65, or that have specialty licenses or are handicapped. So this is one that we want to uh, provide quality fishing on, but again, we're having problems late in the year. We would like to lift the permit requirement from August 16 through September 30th, and, and, and there'd be no reason to close any days during this period. If people wanted to fish, they could. In, in the past few years, the guys have had issue where the pond is really low or the water's warm. So we don't, again, we don't want to be moving hot, you know, fish that are in poor condition to travel and then take them to a place where it could be almost lethal. Uh, it, when fish are st stocked in warm environments, even if they don't die, they're not happy and they don't bite. So that makes for a bad fishing experience. <coughs> Lastly, as if, uh, there's a lot of fisheries going on in Telco. They, they do have a fantastic free fishing day there every year on National Free Fishing Day. And they would like to close a section of that river in the morning so that only kids can fish in it at that time. So we don't have any interlopers coming in saying, well, I'm just here to fish. You can't say I can't. We, we got the fish docked for the event. We want to make sure there's nobody that's not a kid fishing during our kids' fishing event. So that would be just that language right there added to the proclamation. That was it for Telco. A lot going on. But a lot of those changes were a long time coming. I've been hearing complaints from the hatchery managers and the public about all the issues that the, that hot, hot low water is causing. And I'm glad we we're at a time where we can correct all that at one fell swoop, if possible. Uh, the, the next series of trout streams I want to talk about are these four that are located in Polk County. The, these have special restrictions on them. There used to be more of these streams that carried these restrictions. They were they're closed on Fridays from March through May, which was the stocking season. And that was to handle some some stocking logistics that they had to work out with the, the the local officers and the hatchery. They've got all that worked out now. We, we don't need to close it on Fridays anymore. And there was also a, a problem decades ago with people <coughs> snagging too much, and that's why we had to go to a single hook. We, we don't feel that that's necessarily as big an issue now as it was, or any more of an issue than anywhere else in the state. So we would just like to revert these four streams and this will complete all the Polk County streams that ever had special regulations back to statewide fishing regulations. 
And that is the end of the, of the recommendations that the fishery staff has wanted to share with you today. Thank you. Shall I proceed to well, actually, hold questions? Up. Let's okay. Yeah, the questions, if that works. Any questions for Frank? Yes, sir. So the paddlefish, you, 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 you snag the fish, right? That's how you fish for them. Right. So what is it that's on those shoulder seasons where they're not snagging? That just means they're not fishing, but it's out of season, so they weren't supposed to be fishing anyway. So well, there, there, there could be someone that wanted to snag, say, smallmouth buffalo or gar or whatever, but that's okay. very uh, small fishery. Uh, considering what's at stake with protecting paddlefish. Okay, it's so other fish that, okay, I was confused on. Thank you. This is weird. I'm sorry. Can, oh, Commissioner King? The way this is working to me, I know what you, you said, but it almost sounds like to me it's closed for the anglers 16 years old and up. Closed fishing for Sarah, Sarah Wood Camp Road to Dam at Telepatrick from a half hour noon before sunrise to noon for anglers 16 and older. Sounds like it's close to them. Yeah. Yep, because they're not kids anymore after 16. But it, I, I agree. I, I wouldn't. Okay. I, I wrote it that way to follow the proclamation language. It's not the same grammar I'd like to use in my creative writing for sure. But I'm sorry that there. We, we, we had it all wrong twice leading up to that on the other dates too. So I feel your pain on that. Commissioner Stroud. The 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 stream is drying up. Or the stream that's hard, that's having a hard time. Yeah. And you, be, you went back to the flow information, 1927 or whatever. Has it been this bad for 10 years, 15 years, five years? And the question is, it, if is it going to continue to get worse? Or do you do you know that or not? Or is there any? Is this a cycle, 100-year cycle, whatever it is? Is it what's what's the deal on that? Is it going to get better? Well, I, I think we had the advantage of having a really long record of time to look at, and and they they looked at a, a, the, the last 20 years, and they've been seeing a, a lot of a lot of problems with with the flow levels. I, I can't predict the future, but I I can say that I, I'm glad we're finally addressing it because when I used to be the trout coordinator forever ago, that was an ongoing thing, and you know these things creep up on us slowly, and then finally you go. We really got a problem here. We got to fix it. It's kind of like when we had to quit stocking lake trout in, in some of the lakes that got too hot to hold lake trout. It, after a while of thinking you're, you're really managing it, you realize you're not, and you, you've got to walk away. It, it could turn around, and we might have a trend where we could go into a weather pattern where we get water for a few years, and we might be back saying, well, it looks like this is the new normal. But it, g given this is our normal now, we really need to do this. Other questions? Yes, sir. Commissioner Gardner. <coughs> Thank you, Chairman. Um, Frank, appreciate the uh, in-depth review. I just had one question on the uh, the Teleco River. Um, you said people had to call the hatchery to get the uh, stock locations and and dates. Um, can't we list that on social media and, and make it available to where they don't have to make a phone call to do that this the, day the phone, the phone call was the sure way to get the information that day, and I'm looking for Mark. But the uh, I know there was when that season would roll in, there would be press releases. I'm sure that would roll out to various platforms within the agency as well. But, but is that something that we do not update on a daily? Um, I mean, you're stocking Thursdays and Fridays. It seems like we could dynamically update that. You know, to make I, it current. I think we could. I know that they, that's, I'm getting a nod from from Mark Thurman there. If you'd like to hear his answer, I'd be happy to invite him up. Sure. Please, as the chairman. Thank you. For a time, we were posting that on Facebook Weekly. We've had a it, that went away for a bit. We're bringing it back, and that's a really good resource to get the information out. But okay. we have been doing it. There was a a uh, a break in that for for this year but the past uh two three years we've been putting that on facebook which is a good way to get it out but you said weekly right yeah it's it's stocked weekly from for that time period right. that frank mentioned from so if you start middle thursday, of march to sep um on friday morning can they access thursday stocking mm -hmm. well, i guess they can't fish till saturday they can't anyway. fish till saturday right right, right. so uh by, right. by and we uh, gradually friday moved afternoon. that that stocking zone shrinks as the summer moves on right right i gathered that okay well thank you very much i got another question on the green cove pond you kind of alluded to it but i'm assuming that uh when you would do the no permit between august 16th and september 30th 
there would be no stocking associated with that also? It, it, that wouldn't be in proclamation, this, but that's probably how they would do it. it I think if they, if they weren't having hot water issues at the hatchery, they might put a few fish up there. They, they, they take care of Grinco Pond pretty well because it's just right there by the hatchery. But if, if the fish are, the, the reason they wanted to avoid that is not only the, what might be happening in Green Cove Pond, but what the condition of the fish are in the hatchery. So if they're in good shape, you'd stock anyway. I, I wouldn't, I don't know why they, they always keep some fish in there, but it's, right. we wouldn't want to have people expected to be heavily stocked like we do normally. Okay. There's no there's no weekly schedule for Green Cove Pond either. It's just when they think they need to get more fish in there from, from feedback. I got you. All right, one last question. On the um, Tillico River, the uh, closure for anglers 16 and older, I thought we just changed the, uh, the youth hunts to include 16-year-olds. And I'm wondering why uh, we didn't make that 17 and older if we we're going to do the hunts 16 is eligible to hunt in a youth hunt? Well, I, we based it outside of thinking about the hunting, but you know, the, the youth angler stops at 15 because at 16 they buy the adult license. So that, that, that's where we drew that line. Yeah. And that can be I just, discussed. it seems to make more sense to be consistent, whether it's hunting or fishing, um, to me. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Right, Commissioner Cox. Um, Frank on the snagging is, is, um, we close the season, I, and, and I had talked earlier, but to one of the other guys that, uh, we're closing sport fishermen after a certain date because the fish leave there and there's nothing for them to catch. And, and the question is, why wouldn't we just leave it open and let them, let them fish if they're, Fish are leaving. What difference does it make? I mean, they well, eventually they the leave. Still they, they, eventually they do leave, but the opportunity, but at, at that March 15 date, we there could still be paddle fish in that area. So we would want, we only want to allow access to them for that two week period, and then after that, no one should have any business up there with snagging equipment. So we we anticipate those fish being there. There's a lot of other game fish up in there at that time too, that we'd be protecting with that but 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 the fact that they would be there is why we're closing it in the, on that second on, on, after the season for a brief period of time okay um, I'm gonna follow up on the questions you had about the Teleco River if this is the trend if we're having to, to change stocking and restrict opportunity what's if that continues what are we going to do about it well, the bigger issue is how we're going to operate a hatchery in That's what 20. I'm okay, question. yeah. What are you going to do about it? Well, we've got we can't make it rain more. I don't, I don't, I, there's not much we can do. We can prepare by having better access to the water supplies that we have, and there, there we still have that mixing box at at Teleco that we we could improve on that that allows us to use water from the two water sources. But by and large, if we we get into a a drought up there, I mean, the last Probably big drought was in 07. 16 was a bad one as well. I mean, yeah, we've been close to, it, that was the year that it got bad enough that we said no more, and we had to stock a lot of the fish out of Teleco Hatchery. We moved them to tailwaters all across the state, and people got extra fish, and people really enjoyed it too, but people at Teleco didn't like it because their fish had to go other places. So that, that's kind of how we're adapting to that. In the year that it's really bad, we've, we've got to have a plan. What are we going to do with the fish if, August gets here and we don't have water. That's what we're doing right now. So your bigger issue is not water for the hatchery, it's water in the river? The water from the river supplies the hatchery. Yeah, but you, you said you had to move the fish somewhere else. Why couldn't you just put them in the Teleco River? Well, then we never get them back. We, we need them for later in the year. We, we got to hold fish for, we're growing fish, so these aren't fish that are ready to necessarily be stocked. Okay, yeah. all right, I see. Yeah. Uh, so there's not, if this continues, you may run out of water for the hatchery. In some years, yeah. Now there's you know, there's chillers, there's things like that, but that gets expensive, and we'll have to look at that when that time comes. It, we've only had two years in the last 20 that I'm aware of where we had to get rid of fish. And we've we've had issues at hatcheries for other reasons too. So it's not, you know, that happens. We don't like it, but it, it can happen. But this if this is a long-term trend, we'll probably be doing things like. Uh, 
changing our management of how we handle fish and move fish around in each year. And if that starts to get routine, then we have to ask some other questions about how useful that hatchery is. But I don't think we're there yet. How we're not. How many gallons a day does it, do you run through there? Uh, can you re we, the, the water? Re the recirculation could be possible as well. Yeah, that would be another costly fix, but, but it's something we've considered at other hatcheries. We could do a recirculation unit there. Um, but that's power. That's 24-7 power. We haven't done it yet. Um, we've also had to add uh, oxygen to the, to the raceways more frequently to keep these fish on life support during these situations. But yeah, that's a good point. The, I blanked on that. The recirculation systems are our technology we could use, but I, I don't feel that we're quite there in, in this period right now. I think if we, we may, maybe it'll turn the other way. Like we is there were too much water for a well. I don't know what the well conditions would be. I mean, that's all surface water up on the mountain. That's coming. It's coming down off of uh, Telco Mountain, the, the ridge there. There's a none of the water we get is coming from a, an artesian well like we have at say Buffalo Springs or Flintville. This is all actual creek. A lot of the time, these guys that work, gals that work at the hatchery, they spend getting the leaves out of the intake because it's all surface flow in the fall. They got to get all the leaves out of the way. It's a really uh, difficult hatchery to operate. But if if it wasn't for that long time traditional fishery down there that needs a lot of fish we it, I, I don't know if, i don't know if you go out and build them there if you were starting out tomorrow but we we've, we've got a great tradition down there and we we don't want to shut that hatchery down we want to operate it thank you sure any other questions um frank i know that in um the last actually probably several years but certainly in the last year we've had discussions uh about uh, potential adjustments at Dale Hollow and so I know y'all have put a great deal of time and effort into understanding what the issues are what the impacts are and your team has been thinking about it and researching it a lot and I would appreciate if you have time uh, and are ready if you would share that information with us now during the preview okay I, I can do that we we have spent a considerable amount of time on on Dale Hollow and I, I didn't include it in this presentation because it's not a, a recommendation that we were going to make I don't usually make recommendations about things we're not recommending but Mark Thurman is here to do that he's got some uh, some information that we that we collected over the last couple of years and he's got a short presentation he'd like to share with us Great, thank, thank you. you Mark Mark is our region 3 fisheries manager and he, he covers that, that area from Dale Hollow down to Watts Bar and beautiful country in between. Had to grow it back. All right. Thank you, Madam Chairman, Thank for you. giving me the opportunity to present on this work that we've uh, been doing at Dale Hollow. Um, the uh, topic of the presentation is management of this uh, smallmouth fishery at Dale Hollow. We're going to touch on some of the work that we do there that we've been doing for some time. I'm uh, going to also talk about some survey work that we were directed to do by the commission uh, back in 2016. and, and uh, give an overview of the results that we got in that survey. You can't really talk about Del Hollow without talking about this world record. And it certainly has added to the legacy of Del Hollow. Um, and it's, it's legendary, probably won't ever be broken. That's a, probably a one-of-a-kind fish. And while that, that does contribute to that draw, The quality of the fishing at Dale Hollow is, is the draw. Um, we have anglers from all over the country that will come to fish for the smallmouth bass in Dale Hollow. Now, anytime we talk about fisheries management, I think it's a really good idea to kind of step back and talk a little bit about what a fishery is. Um, we kind of throw that term out there. And this is a bit of a complicated uh, uh, figure, came out of a textbook, fisheries textbook. But the main things to look at here are, it's three components really. It's the fish, it's the habitat, 
that the fish are living in and it's people and the people is a big part of the fishery and and a lot of our work that we do is geared at understanding what a fishery means to a group of people the people that fish it people that make a living off of it um, and that's how we approach fisheries management um, as professionals and 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 as a commission really those keeping those components in mind and while a lot of this presentation is going to deal with our angler survey or you'll hear us call it our creel survey um, I think it's important to also throw out there that we have a whole lot of monitoring efforts that go on in a reservoir like Dell Hollow any reservoir across the state throughout the fisheries program we've got um, Electrofishing efforts that go to monitor fish populations, looking at things like size, structure, uh, abundance, uh, growth, condition. Um, and those tell us a lot about the fish population. Um, we also do things like summer seine checks through the summer to get an idea of what our bass reproduction was in a given year. Um, but the krill survey that we have out there, and, and in our state we have, the, the agency has a great krill program. Um, it helps us understand what's going on with the people part of managing fisheries. So this is a, a timeline for Del Hollow. Excuse me. Um, of course, from the time this is to deal deals with the regulations at Del Hollow, uh, from the time that the reservoir was impounded in 1943 to uh, 1992. It was managed under statewide regulations, uh, typically a 10, 10 black bass limit, no minimum length limit. Um, by 1992, the quality of the fishery had started to decline, the fishing had, had declined, and there was a whole lot of interest in doing something there. And with, uh, with a lot of public support, we put in a 18 inch minimum length limit to fish, krill limit, on the smallmouth bass at Dale Hollow. This was also about the time a lot of interest in, in smallmouth bass across the state and management of that species really kind of took a, an elevated place. And, and we do that with fish. I mean, there are some species that just that rise above, and, and that's why we have a license plate with smallmouth bass on it in Tennessee. And the smallmouth bass is, is, a, is a special fish in, in Tennessee. Uh, so from 1992 through 2000, it was managed under that 18-inch uh, minimum length limit. Um, but towards 2000, uh, some concerns about the quality of fishing came back. Um, a lot of concern about over-harvest of those lar larger fish. And with, a, with an 18-inch minimum length limit, uh, it targets harvest. And Dell Hollow was a place where you know, people would, would harvest smallmouth. Uh, and so trying to look at the monitoring data that we had public opinion we moved towards what we now have the uh, 16 to 20 inch 21 inch slot with one fish above and one fish below and it's it's been managed under that regulation since 2000 um, and the uh, you know over the years with looking at our monitoring of the populations looking at the monitoring of what the people there thought about our management um, we've not really brought any recommendations to the to the Commission to change anything on Del Hollow in uh, 2013 we started something that uh, uh, our, our program uh, we, we wanted to look a little bit more and get a little bit more out of our creel surveys so we added a what we called a uh, angler attitude survey where we ask people about you know how's your experience been what do you think of our management what species are you targeting and one of the main questions that we ask them is how do you rate the quality of fishing in this reservoir and this is the the figure that you see here these are the results that we've had and we've maintained a really good satisfaction rating up there and uh, when you look at those numbers you say well Things are things are in, in pretty good shape at Del Hollow. 
Some of the other information we gather are, is related to the species they're targeting and other activities. Uh, I know a lot of discussions have come up about, you know, limitations on um, tournament fishing. So this was an important question for us. Uh, pretty high percentage of anglers in Del Hollow targeting bass uh, over that from 2013 to 2017, uh, 70%. Um, out of that 70%, you had about 37% that fished in tournaments. And on average, they fish nine tournaments a year. And there are, there are some tournaments that take place there. There's uh, several tournament series that hit Del Hollow. Um, but that's, that's the participation that, that we got. And one of the other things that we ask people is, do you have management recommendations? And this is where that people component and, and trying to pick the right management strategy really, really gets interesting. You know, you'll ask a person, and we will get this, what, what do you think about, do you have any recommendations? And we will get a wide range of answers. It's a diverse range of answers that you get. Everything from very restrictive to very liberal. And, uh, you know, that, that's been the benefit of, of this survey and, and getting a little bit of a better finger on the pulse of what's, what's happening at Del Hollow. Uh, so again, based on the results of our survey work, uh, based on uh, the monitoring work that we do, we, we've been doing, we really hadn't come with recommendations. But in 2015, in the fall, during the regulation setting process, uh, the topic of Del Hollow came up. And uh, following those discussions, uh, it was, it was uh, the commission's direction given to us to incorporate some questions in the survey to look at alternatives and see what the, what the angling uh, population at Del Hollow thought about it. Um, one of the, uh, and this is, this is our angler survey, you can see the questions that we ask, um, and the uh, question, the uh, proposed regulation change or alternative from the commission was a, a seasonal adjustment in our slot limit that would allow a two fish per day 18 inch minimum length limit between October 1st and May 15th and then going back to that slot limit in May 15, at May 15th. Um, as we asked these questions to anglers, we uh, incorporated a couple things into the survey. We alternated how we presented it to the anglers. Um, and we also incorporated field biologists into the survey process. So it wasn't just one person doing the survey. We had field biologists out there through at, at different times during the, during the survey process. And they participated. And there's a really good thing. They got a lot of insight into, uh, and, and it was good for them to talk with, with the anglers out on Del Hollow. Um, so this was the survey that we did. And these were the results. Um, we had 77% of the people surveyed supported the current regulations. Um, the light blue there is the, uh, the Fish and Wildlife Commission's proposal. Um, it was 2%. Um, the uh, no opinion, 3%. And then that other was 18%, 93 anglers. And it, it reflected what we see when we ask people for recommendations. It was it was very diverse um, and so that that's the result and and when we um, uh, you know that it, it followed it tracked with what we had been seeing in the previous years art can I ask a question real quick when yes. you go back to the pie chart I think I can <coughs> just so I'm tracking and and we're all tracking will you repeat what the um, it was the proposal for the slot change. I see that it says TFWC. That is the seasonal deviation from the, the slot limit. Okay. With, where you would go to a two fish, 18 inch size limit. Right. From um, October to May. Right, and just so I, we're clear on what commission action has and hasn't occurred, that was a request from a member of commission that was not a commission proposal. Exactly. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Just so my memory's right on that. 
And that's the 2%. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Having a cursor issue here. So, following that fall meeting, um, the uh, some members of the Del Hala Lake Marina Owners uh, Operators Association uh, had watched the uh, the recording of the uh, of the meeting and saw the discussion about Del Hollow. Uh, they contacted us to uh, talk to them about it, and so we went and met with them. Um, we uh, we outlined what what the survey was about. They were interested in the survey, and we talked to them about what was taking place. Um, and in response to our meeting, they sent this letter to the agency, um, and they were they were in support of the current regulations. I think. The fishing economy at, at Del Hollow is a different fishing economy than at a Kentucky Lake or at a Dayton, Tennessee. Um, it's, there are a lot of guides there. The marinas rent cabins, rent boat slips. Uh, people come spend a week at a time there to fish. And they seemed pretty happy with the current state of that fishing economy at Del Hollow. And I think this letter reflects that. So uh, we don't have any, we, we were asked uh, by one of the commissioners last fall to come with recommendations and, you know, based on the work that we've got, we don't have any management recommendations. We would like to just keep the reg regulations as they are. Um, and with that, I would take any questions. Also, I can add one more thing. Absolutely. We have a, we have a report put together for you um, that we can send, send with you. Uh, and you can have some time to review it and look at it. It summarizes all of this. I think that would be re very helpful. Y'all spent a lot of time um, researching this, and I think it would be very helpful to make sure that, given that this is the preview window, that, that we have that. And I don't know what the process of making that accessible to the public is, but I think that would be very helpful just to make sure that the information that's on, you know, being shared today during the, free, the preview is available. Well, we have copies for you all today. Be great. Thank you. Commissioner Sanders. Mark, just one question. Um, and I was trying to read it and listen at the same time. You said you asked the question a couple of different ways when you were actually doing the survey. Can you go over that again just to make sure? We alternated how we presented the question. Uh, the proposal for the deviation from the current regulation was offered first at, in one interview, offered second in the other interview with our current regulation. They, we just rotated those so that there was no bias in, in the order of presentation. Okay, thank you. Would you like to see the actual questions that were asked? I think, was that was, was that it's what a, was it's It'll be in the presentation, report? perfect. Uh, I can go back, no, no, but no, it's no, also that's okay. up here, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Be great, thanks. Commissioner Cox? Um, do you have, uh, you do electrofishing up there. Do you have, age and population data that you can include in that report? Well, I have the report prepared for you here today, which dealt with the survey work. Okay. And there's some other insight into what we see in our uh, other monitoring efforts that we have there, but it's not in that report. Well, I'll ask you the question. I'd like to know um, if over the 18 years that it's been this slot limit, what does what do the what's the, and I know that the lake is not as fertile as it was when we grew the the big bass and it's a challenge you know it's getting older and all that I just wonder what the what the age structure in the pot it's is in the in the looks like from now and into the future like it is is it uh, uh, how much harder is it getting to catch a 21 inch fish and you know that kind of thing is it is it does it look pretty good constant it, it, look, it looks good. I mean, it, there's nothing in there that throws any red flags. You see fluctuations um, over time. I think one of the things that that slot limit does 
is it, it builds in some resiliency because you're maintaining stocks of fish 16, 17, 18, 19 inches long, the upper end of the slot when, when things are good and you see it cycled through. So it fluctuates like any other, any other fish population does. Um, and uh, we're not seeing any kind of flags that say, yeah, we really need to look at this. It kind of, it, it, it's working like it should. You end up with a lot of fish towards the top end of that slot. That's kind of a, you know, a 22, 23 inch smallmouth is a, is a pretty big fish. But there are times, you know, I was talking with uh, uh, our crow clerk, Danny Stone out there, and I was asking, you know, okay, what's a, you know, what's a good day uh, for an angler out there in that upper end of the slot? And they can go there and they can catch 20 fish. They might catch 30 fish up in the upper part of that slot. And those are good fish. You know, you're not, you're not ever gonna, you're not gonna grow that world record but you're gonna, you've got a regulation that, that provides high quality fishing and some resiliency to the population. Um, that, that, you know, I think the, uh, our fish kill that, that we had in 20, 2012, thank you, Mike. Um, we didn't see a huge impact, and I think it's because of that, that slot limit. We've got good fish in the population that really adds to the resiliency there and it's it's right back producing it's it's good fishing so what we're doing what you're doing you think is working yes i'm almost there <laughs> you, you wanted me to ask it didn't you <laughs> not really a question um first thank you mark for the time you guys have spent on dale hollow um one question i have if have you I know you focused a lot on this, but time-wise, compared to other reservoirs in that area, how much time have you spent um, with the surveys on this lake compared to others? I'm assuming more. It seems it was it was it was actually to a large degree it was part of our standard survey that we were going to be doing. Uh, some of the some of the uh, things that we implemented in this survey did add to the time and cost. But it was an important thing to look at, um, and and so there was an increase in in cost, um, which is you know I'm, I'm glad I'm getting a chance to to present it today because a lot of work went into it, um, a lot of thought went into putting the survey together. Um, we worked with the commission to 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 chart that path forward, and and uh, you know I, it, it was extra. Um, can't really put a number on it that's right fine. here, but yes. that's fine. Um, anyway, it's just I, I thought Tim Broadbent was here earlier, but he's he over there. He and I mean, I, I'm pretty sure I know I would. I would love to see crappie fishermen at a 90 percent. I mean, happy. So uh, anyway, I'm just 90 uh, percent is a high high number. Um, that's a lot of people happy. Um, so anyway, you guys are doing something right. I just want to commend you for it. Any other questions on this issue? Yes, sir. Uh, Mark, would you tell us how many people approximately did we survey on this? Was this a, a big survey or a small sample? 539. 506. 506. Yeah, that was the other. Okay, thank you, Mike. Um, we only asked these questions to smallmouth bass anglers. We, we whittled it down. Our satisfaction rating, and this is important to, to point out, that's not, not just for smallmouth, that's overall quality fishing, but that's, it's still a good number. As we asked this, this, these questions, when we interviewed an angler, we asked them, are you a smallmouth bass angler? So this is a core group of, of people who target smallmouth on Del Hollow. And that was 506. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And just I appreciate the question because I'd overlooked that that part in my presentation. Yeah, that's great. And just so it's clear with the back and forth, it's 506 smallmouth bass fishermen. Great. And thank the you. The report is is really it, it's got all that in there, so you can you can take some time to look at it. And well, we really appreciate y'all's time, effort, and energy, and we'll make sure that we do. And if we have follow-up questions, we'll certainly uh, get to you between now and the next meeting. Okay? Thank you. With that, Commissioner Woods, is this the right time to ask you if you'd like to be recognized or no? Have you got two more items on your 
He does. He's still got a couple more items. I can do it at the end. I just did, I didn't want to pass by if it was related to sport fishing. If if it's related to sport fishing, I think it probably would be best now if that's all right. Not to put Dave McKinney on the spot, but I was going to ask you if you could come up. And uh, about three weeks ago, I was sitting home watching the evening news, and it came across the screen that uh, we got high levels of mercury showed up in our smallmouth and catfish on the Pigeon River and the Nickajack. Could you kind of explain a little bit about what's going on there? We, I didn't, I don't know anything other than what I saw on TV. I believe that's what you call the spot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's um, for, for the commission in, in general, um, a few weeks ago, TDEC announced um, what's called a precautionary advisory for smallmouth on the Pigeon River and the Nolichucky. And what a precautionary advisory says is that um, you should limit or not consume smallmouth bass for children, um, nursing mothers, um, pregnant women or th those who may become pregnant in the, in the near future. And it's um, based on an EPA number, which is 0.3 parts per million. So um, the announcement does not say that there are high levels of mercury. It just says there are detectable levels of mercury. And the mercury number in fish um, as advised by the Environmental Protection Agency, was lowered about eight years ago from 0.5 parts per million down to 0.3. Um, as far back as nearly 20 years ago, the number was one part per million. So it keeps getting ratcheted down as more toxicology data come in and the health effects, particularly on young young people, children, and uh, in, infants, come in. This this would be the third time we've addressed this, I guess, in the past six years. Um, you recall, about four or five years ago, um, TDEC announced a, a precautionary advisory for the Buffalo River, and then about three years ago, a precautionary advisory for. Uh, the backwaters of Big Sandy and the dewatering area over on Kentucky Lake. Um, the commissioner of TDEC is, has the authority and the responsibility to issue advisories. EPA issues the numbers, and these numbers, um, it's left up to the states to protect what are considered to be atypical consumers. That's uh, fishermen. Uh, the families of fishermen and subsistence fishermen. Um, I would suspect that as more toxicology data come in and as the detection um, capabilities for laboratory analysis get lower and lower and lower, that you will see more streams in Tennessee um, added to this list. When they lowered it from 0.5 to 3, those of us who've been working with it for years knew that for black bass, um, there would be any number of streams in Tennessee affected by this. Um, for contaminants like um, things you're familiar with, uh, PCBs, dioxin, chloridane, those are organic contaminants and they tend to accumulate in the uh, fatty part of the fish and the lipid content. And so when people cook, they often discard the belly fat and whatnot. Um, mercury, a heavy metal, concentrates in the, in the muscle tissue. So it's in that, in that fillet and more likely to be consumed and not discarded during the fishing process. So that adds, adds another level of caution for the most vulnerable uh, people that are most vulnerable to long-term exposure to mercury. I don't know if that goes toward answering your question, but I... Is it naturally occurring? 
the the levels that you're seeing now in uh, the upper part of the buffalo, for instance, and the backwaters of big sanding in the dewatering area, the nolichucky, the pigeon, is almost certainly heavily influenced by atmospheric deposition. Uh, a lot of that mercury comes from coal-fired plant emissions over the last years, but mercury bioaccumulates it. It um, uh, goes through a process where the lower part of the food chain consumes it, and as it moves up through the f food chain, then the top predators get the biggest dose of it, and they build it up over their lifetime. Uh, they don't they don't discard it. They don't metabolize it. Um, and and yeah, there's a, a process called methylation. It's the methyl mercury that's most bioavailable. Um, But Thank as you. far as a point source discharge, no, we're just talking about things in general. Okay. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you. Great. We'll keep moving forward with the agenda. Chief Fiss, welcome back. Okay. This. This next proclamation is our bait proclamation, where, which governs uh, the use of bait, creel limits, and, and how you can catch uh, what, what species are available for bait. And I know that during many of my carp presentations, which there have been many, I often talk about this similarity of appearance between small Asian carp and our common bait species, such as skipjack herring and threadfin and gizzard shad, and how we've been concerned about this is this as a vector for uh, someone accidentally catching and keeping alive a, an Asian carp and moving it to a water body where we don't have Asian carp. Th this accidental incident is one of the vectors for moving carp that's been identified in national carp strategies, the Ohio River strategy. Every time a group gets together and worries about where carp are going, this is one of the things they bring up is you, know, you got to watch this, this side of the, of the puzzle. We, we're routinely asking for federal help for millions of dollars to build barriers to stop carp from moving throughout the Ohio Valley and points beyond. I, I think it's important that as an agency we, a, we ask the question, are we doing what we, what we can do to make sure all these uh, opportunities for movement are considered and, and appropriately addressed. So that, that's why this presentation is occurring today. The, uh, the, our, our standard operating procedure, and this won't, won't change when it comes to thinking about carp as bait, is we want people educated more than we want them regulated on this. They, we're letting people know where the fish are in the waters that are infested with carp with these signs, and we're reminding people through our media outlets like the Fishing Guide and occasional Facebook stuff and the presentations that I do that this could happen, so be wary of it, and please don't move Asian carp accidentally. Our staff are working right now on some, some better cards so that you could have a wallet card to tell the difference between these fish if you're out on the water. And of course, there'd be electronic media available as well. So some states have gone the route of eliminating all movement of shad and herring to prevent this from happening statewide. Other states have taken a stepwise approach. You know, where, are, where, are, where is this potential? most likely to happen and let's limit it there. And other states have, uh, have similar rules that we have, which I'll go over, is it is already illegal to move carp or to have live Asian carp without any, any regulation change. It's already illegal to dump bait because you're, you're essentially stocking fish. That's an illegal act already in our, in our code or proclamation, wherever that is. So what, what would be the harm be? What would be the harm if just a few fish got out in a new body of water where we don't have Asian carp yet? Well, it really depends on how successful they are as individuals. If they never reproduce, you're talking about dozens of fish maybe at best getting lost in a, in a, in a large reservoir probably. And being at a really low abundance, 
their probability of encountering a boat and, and creating that hazard of carp jumping and hitting someone is, is way lower than it would be on, say, a Kentucky lake where there's millions of carp. And, and these fish would have little impact on the, on the food chain or the natural resources. You know, they, would, they would probably grow to be two, three feet long and die. That would be their, their life. If, if this happened routinely and multiple people were moving a few fish here and there and they could get up a school of fish and it would be a problem to, to motor through or you'd be more likely to get hit by them when they're jumping, that could be another problem. But it's still a, a, a best case scenario is that th those fish do not reproduce. If there is reproduction where, where, these, where fish are moved to, to a new area, then we have a high potential. These fish are extremely fecund. They've, uh, an adult can have a million eggs. They've got, uh, if, if they were successful again, and we'll talk more about that in a minute, you know, the boating hazards that we're dealing with on Kentucky Lake would be prevalent in this new water body. We'd have fisheries impacts and that certainly it would, it would get in the way of people's uh, fishing day, which is what we're seeing on Kentucky Lake at this time. And, and the impacts would be irreversible. Once these fish start reproducing, we don't have a way to make that stop yet. And I don't know that we will. So it will be costly to control over time. A another issue is that l let's say we're successful in, in getting a barrier installed at, say, Gunnersville Dam, which would be a, an ideal spot right now to protect Upper East Tennessee from silver carp getting on into Chickamauga or our, our Upper Tennessee waters. That, Millions are spent to get that barrier in place, and then suddenly we have fish that have jumped the barrier by, by bait bucket introduction, and that population takes off. It would negate all that work that happened downstream. So that's, we have a responsibility to other states in this as well. But that, that's why this is such an important discussion to have. But you know, luckily, carp, we, we, carp are not that easily, they, they don't have a, they're very specific spawning requirements. You can't just put them in any pond or still water and, and expect them to, to spawn. They rely on moving water. The scenario would be that they, they want water at 65 to 80 degrees, which is most of the spring, summer, a, a much longer, wider window than our, our, some of our native fish experience for sure. So these fish are spawning in turbulent water and they're relying on those eggs, which are semi-buoyant, to, to ride the currents and turbulence to stay suspended. If they fall to the bottom and get covered with really just any sediment, they're, gonna, they're not going to be successful. So it's the, when you read the literature, you know, they, they say things like up to the, the shortest I've found right now is 15 miles of river they would need to spawn. Some of the larger, the longer estimates are 60 miles of river. Now that's, that's all temperature dependent. Th this piece of uh, the puzzle here between spawning and hatching at, at warm temperatures can happen in a day and a half. So you could have a springtime or, or summertime three inch rain where the rivers get up for a day or two and they would have the habitat to do that. But, but not, not all, if any of our lakes upstream of where carp already are, are suitable spawning habitat, I know that all of them wouldn't be, but there's some that concern me more than others. So let's remind ourselves where big head carp and silver carp are. This blood red line to the west is Mississippi River, Ohio River systems. And you can go there today and catch young carp. They're, they're abundant every year. There's been successful spawning in that system. When you look at this, these pink lines above me here, the, that's the Tennessee and Cumberland system. We, we have never documented uh, reproduction in the Tennessee Cumberland rivers, but we did have a, a very super abundant year class become very present in the, in, in the Kentucky Lake and Barkley Lakes. I, we think a big part of that could have been reproduction, but we don't know where, but we can't confirm it. And certainly there's ongoing and uh, migration into the Cumberland and Tennessee rivers from the Ohio system through Kentucky Dam and, and Barkley Dam. So we, we had an opportunity in 2015 where there were small fish in Kentucky and Barkley lakes that could have been confused for anything. That they were, they were small enough that people, in fact, we even had uh, some, some other professionals come in to help us out 
on, on a sample, and they and and they they were they were looking at Threadfin Shad and calling them silver carp, but they hadn't seen Threadfin Shad before. So anyway, it's a long. Uh, it's not hard. A lot of people make an honest mistake when they look at these fish, especially if you only see one and you don't have the others for comparison. But anyway, I put this map up just so you know where they are now. And we want to protect the waters that are blue there where we don't have particularly silver carp. So what is at risk? You know, these are the main stem impoundments that are upstream of, known, of the known carp distribution in, in any real numbers. And I know that if we don't get successful barriers or controls in place downriver, fish are going to work their way up through these locks. That, that's going to happen whether we have an amendment to the bait proclamation or not. That's all independent of, of, of that question, but it is depending on barriers that we're working on on other fronts. But still, if we had fish inadvertently moved upstream to say Fort Loudon and those fish did well, they would populate the downstream areas because they have, while they, they go upstream through locks, they can go downstream through locks and through the gates and through the turbines. So we would expect downstream migration to be much easier than, down, than upstream is. So what else is at risk is all these tributary impoundments that are, that are, uh, that are they ha don't have a lock on them. You can't take a boat and go upstream into Priest or Norris or any of these other lakes. Their only way fish would get into these lakes would be if they were accidentally hauled or into these lakes. So these, these, are, these are areas that we want to protect as well. Well, when we look at the, the risk assessment here, you know, what's the, what's the, how much risk should we control? Well, what, what is the cost if we, if we do something proactive or uh, to, to try to control bait movement. We have a lot of people that fish with live bait in the state. People do it various different ways. But when I think of live bait fishing, there's no one more, more dedicated to the art than striped bass fishermen. So I'm using this example. You know, we, we, we manage for striped bass across the state. We stock over a million a year. It generates about 60,000 trips each year. And a lot of the fishermen that, 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 that participate use live bait and some of them have pretty specialized places they want to get bait and move bait so it's of concern to that user group for sure and we we, we want to do the best we can to protect the control for the risk while we still offer as much opportunity as possible so let's go over just in broad category or alternatives that were discussed there's actually more than just these but this, they kind of fall into these categories anyway we can continue with what we're doing you know, educate, don't regulate, and, and see how we do. Uh, we could do a rapid response where we, we, right now we haven't had any young fish observed in Tennessee since 2015. I'm still waiting for someone to bring in a, a, a young Asian carp that was, it was caught this year. We've had people, a lot of people apparently, call in Region 1 saying, I've got one, I've got one, and, and luckily it hasn't been one. So it, it, maybe we wait until we have that happen, and then we rush in with a proclamation change to say, no, we don't want to have people taking bait from this water. The, at issue with that would be that it takes at least two months to get a proclamation through. I mean, by the time we set it up, come here, talk about it, get it signed, and then the, it was a month of downtown yet so before it would actually be ruled. And if we did this number two style approach, we would certainly want to close the Mississippi River and its tributaries right now. Another alternative was a limited restriction. This would restrict waters where carp, especially young carp, have been observed in the past, essentially, in substantial numbers. And to, to fall into that category, I would say that would be Kentucky Lake, Barkley Lake, and pretty much the Missis the west to the Mississippi River, including Mississippi River. Even though there's a lot of water in between, but to keep the regulation simple, you'll see I've got that included. Lastly, we could follow the Kentucky or Arkansas model and prohibit the transport of shad and skipjack away from the water throughout the state and just say we're, 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 we're not going to concern ourselves with this risk anymore. We're just going to go statewide and, and follow suit with these states. And I'm, I'm sure that States like Georgia, uh, at least Georgia, has been very interested in what we have in the Tennessee River and what people are moving into Georgia. But anyway, that, that's a, a much more conservative approach for sure. 
So what, what we've decided on as, staff, as in our staff, and this was one of the tougher decisions that we've, we've made in a while about how much risk can we expose ourselves to and how much opportunity do we want to give up for people. It's not that people can't fish anymore, but it does really restrict how they fish. The, uh, the, we, our recommendation is that on Kentucky, Pickwick, Barkley Reservoirs and their tributaries, which would include the uh, Duck River up to Normandy Dam, which we get, gets a lot of sh uh, carp activity and all waters west of Kentucky Le Reservoir, we would want to skipjack herring, gizzard shad and threadfin shad may not be transported away from the water alive. Now there's still a lot an angler can do with this restriction. Uh, here's the area roughly that it would affect. We've got to work out how to describe this best for a fishing guide scenario, but this is where we're at right now. So you can see it, it covers Tennessee River and, and Barkley Lake and that, that projection there out <coughs> eastward is the Duck River Basin. So this proposed restriction limits transport in only one direction, and that's an important point. Fishermen can still do a lot of things they're currently doing. You would still be able to harvest bait within a restricted water body like, uh, and, and keep it alive on the water that day. So you could drive to Kentucky Lake, catch your shad, fish with them, and then get you can't put them back. You've got to destroy them and then, then leave the water at that point. And that's a lot, how a lot of fisheries can work. It's nice if you can get bait on the water. Everyone wants to do that if you can, but you can't always do that. We realize that. Uh, another thing that you can do is collect live bait on non-restricted waters and haul it to that water body. So in, in a local scenario here, you could go to, uh, say, Old Hickory Lake, collect bait, and drive to Kentucky Lake if you wanted to with those fish. You just couldn't take them home again because they couldn't leave the water alive. You could purchase live bait and use it on restricted waters or unrestricted waters for that matter. And you, any bait that you buy or, or take from unrestricted waters, you could possess at your home and, and keep them for bait in the future. Which I know a lot of this does, does go on and it's an important part of some fisheries. So I think it's important that we, we ask this question and, and we, we have some recommendation for you. And at this time, I'll take any questions from the commission if you'd like, Madam Chairman. Any questions for members of commission? Yes, sir. Commissioner Stroud. How long do these things live? Probably, well, I'd say most of them are living through, say, eight years. And after that, they start to get really? more scarce, you know, like, like a lot of fish. But they're uh, just off the top of my head. Is anyone going to correct me that's been reading that? I don't know. Eight's a safe bet. I bet we've had them out, out to 13 or 14 in, in the data we have. We have that data. I just don't off the top of my head. Because the big head carp live a lot longer than the silver carp from our experience so far. But you know, so a little while. Any other questions? Yes, sir, Commissioner Gardner. Thank you, Chairman. Um, is, are there any regulations for the bait distributors? I mean, are they doing taking precautions to ensure that their, the baits they're delivering to, uh, to bait stores aren't, don't have Asian carp in them? Well, the, the, the bait dealers, the people that, that, have, that would have a fish dealer's license, which covers bait dealers in Tennessee, would have to follow the bait proclamation about how they harvest bait. So they wouldn't be able to harvest bait from these waters any more than anyone else could. If they were buying bait, chances are they're buying them from Arkansas, which is where all the, those bait dealers, those hatcheries are for growing out bait. And because Arkansas has gone to <coughs> effective October 1st, Arkansas will go to a no uh, harvest of bait, you got you basically they have to buy a lot more than they would have before. That that industry is ramping up with a certification process to have certified uh, shad available for purchase. So any most of the live bait that we get in in Tennessee is raised in other states and in much larger facilities. But we also are working on our to be announced, but we're working on our, our rule that, that manages processes around that fish dealer 
license, and we'll be bringing that later this year. So we're going to address anything that we leave uh, unaddressed in that rule. That is our intention. Because when it gets into importing and exporting, it's best to have those types of uh, that type of language in rule. Commissioner Cox. Yeah, I've got a I've got a concern about how this is going to be enforced. It's kind of like CWD banning from some county in Wisconsin. How do you know? How are you going to enforce that this that that a that a boat with live bait that stopped or at a boat dock in unrestricted waters? Didn't that those fish didn't come from Kentucky Lake? How do you, how it'd, do you be, the, it'd be on the officer to witness the person leaving the water with a live with a live well with live fish, which wouldn't be hard to. I don't think that would be difficult to in, enforce. We you know we, we could have that as. I'll just leave it there. I don't I don't think that's as hard to enforce as it might sound. Now how much how much effort we would be able to put towards that is is another question that I can't answer. Any other questions? Commissioner Box? What would you say, Frank, what they have written, exactly where they're located, like where they haven't reached yet? I think we were Kentucky, Barkley. Like where have we, they? We have, well, we see adult fish as high up stream in the Cumberland River as Cordell Hull Dam, which would include Old Hickory Lake. But we, we did not include Old Hickory or Cheatham because when, when we had all those small fish, they were most abundant in Barkley and Kentucky, which lets us think that there was migration of small fish through those locks upriver. And by the time they get further upstream, they're much bigger. So that reduces the probability of somebody mixing them up. Mm -hmm. But if we were to go out and see a bunch of small fish in an old hickory or Cordo hole, it, you know, hopefully not yet there, but if we were to see that, we would want to revisit any kind of limited restriction we had. Or if we started seeing them in, a, in time in uh, Nickajack or, or Gunnersville. So. All right, thank you. I've got a follow up, Ms. Madam Chairman. How much of, uh, and I suppose we'll hear from I guess we're going to hear from fishermen, but um, how often is this done? I mean, how, why would you have to move from Melton Hill to 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 Clinch or? Well, if you if you had a trip, why couldn't you catch bait at every at every place you're going to fish? It, it's hard some places. I mean, if you if you're going to meet your buddies on I don't know Norris Lake or, or I don't know just a lake near somewhat nearby, but you didn't have all morning all night to go get bait and then get your act together and get over there to meet them to go fishing you might want to get your bait the night before and you might not you might know that you can be way more efficient on this water body than another with your cast net then on top of that you may want to have a certain size fish that nobody else has in that tournament let's say oh i can get a nice big gizzard chad from my from my lake and when i go fish this tournament i think i'll have this advantage or you uh you may not get the right species that you want where, where you're going, even though you might bring a legal fish to use. So, but a, a lot of people do collect bait on the water. I, I, we don't have data to say how, what percentage of live bait use is is carried to the water, particularly from these areas. It, it's uh, we have striped bass fisheries and other live bait fisheries in Kentucky Lake and West Tennessee, but not it's not. To me, it's not as specialized as it once you get in the middle and East Tennessee is, is how, how limiting is. You can get bait on Kentucky Lake, I yes. believe, if you went fishing there. Commissioner King? You also said, uh, you also said that um, n as of today, nobody has, they've called you, but just like I sent you that picture of those minnows, but you've not mm -hmm. identified any that were silver carp. That were, that, were, that were Asian carp that were small. Yeah, we've small. not. We've not what, are we, what are we talking about, small? Just a set. I would say anything we've seen under, them small. like the fish on this bucket here, I don't know how big a bucket is, but that's probably what a seven inch fish or so. Anything there and down. I mean, the, the, the people are going to be more likely to confuse a really small fish, but they may be less likely to keep it as bait because they want bigger fish. It just depends on what they're doing. Because we did we, the, the ones that were killed and were flopping on the bank, yeah. they were small. Ones we saw and they were small, but not yeah. minnow size, but they were 
Well, that was back in late 15, though, right? No, or just rec just recently, the the one we saw quite uh, a few on the bank. And you sent them to? Uh, I didn't send them because you we got a letter from no, we got a letter from you saying y'all had uh, seen those fish. Well, we had a. Uh, we had a fish kill that you're referring to yes. on carp in the lake and yes. we, we believe it was just carp only so we, we would want to know about those fish and we had a lot of people on the water it could have been that they were affecting shad in that area that something totally i mean different. they weren't minnow cycle obviously they but they were they were six or seven inches a lot of that we saw up on the bank yeah we we it doesn't cost anything to take a picture and send it to me so we'll, we'll, we'll do it we'll look at them well, the reason we didn't is we'd gotten that email from you saying y'all were. Well, we were. We did. We had crews on the water. But we're. We you know, we've we've got people. We've got a lot of people. We're really happy. The public is, is is hearing the message from different sources. I know the federation put their web page together saying if you see something you think are small fish, call this number. That calls my office, and we'll we'll follow up with it, and we'll be asking for pictures or you know keep keep samples. Uh, we we really we really need to know that because that informs not only the fact that we need to increase our educational efforts in that area but also if we're having reproduction then it changes the que the the questions that we ask about where the next barrier needs to be as well so that's or the first barrier at this point so that's all i have i'm sorry are you done with questions on the bait proclamation if it's okay so two seconds so i've had a couple of requests for um a bit of a break and so before do you have a thought? I, I, I think there may be people in the audience that want to speak to the bait I was going to, before well. we took a break, mm -hmm. ask if there was anybody, and actually on sport fishing too, because I did not ask for comments from the audience on that. So um, does anybody else have any other questions for him on this? Great. Uh, and if, if that's it, I'd love to ask any members of the public if they'd like to make comment on either the sport fishing proposal or the preview of bait proposals, if you would come before us. Yes, sir. Uh, would you come, so a few things while you're walking up, if you'll introduce yourself, if you represent an organization, please let us know that, where you're from, just to be friendly, uh, if you'd like, and if you would direct any questions or comments that you have to me so that we can make sure that we get those answered between now and... Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, my name's Mike Kelly, commercial fisherman. Most of this don't apply to me, except that commercial fishermen go to the dam and dip shad to bait trot lines. And this is, hearing all of the problems and all the issues, I do, I'm just here to offer you a suggestion. Uh, where they caught them and how they're hauling them and they're hauling them over here to fish and the game warden don't know if they're going here or there or where they're going. I would offer you a suggestion to make a rule that you cannot pour bait fish in the river, period. You got them, you went to the river, you can't pour them in the river. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. I appreciate your suggestion very much. We all do. Thank you. Any other comments for the public? Got one here. Sir, if you join us at the microphone, introduce yourself. And just as a reminder, I know a lot of folks have done this before, but if you're new, welcome. Um, and there is a three-minute limit. Okay. Thank you. I won't be three minutes. My name is uh, Joe James. I'm a guide. Uh, I got on Priest and on the Cumberland River, and we catch a lot of shad. Sometimes we have to meet people at 6 in the morning, 5.30 or whatever, and shad's not as easy to catch as you might think sometimes you know you have to so i've thrown a hundred net a hundred times finally caught 50 bait you know but we support i'm also a vice president of the percy priest hybrid striper club and uh we support uh, twra and the commission we 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 think y'all have the uh best intentions for the for the wildlife and the fisheries in tennessee and we we, we appreciate your uh, hard work on this and uh, as a club, we support the uh, recommendation that Frank had there for the limited restrictions where if you find, you know, a handful of Asian carp in Percy Priest Lake, then uh, of course you would have to limit that bait restrictions on that particular lake. But we as a club do support that. And I think it's a minimum, I, I think it's the right thing to do without going crazy with it you know and mm -hmm. limiting everybody from doing anything because uh, we do uh, 
we uh, people I took out yesterday morning they had to buy a license you know and of course that's that's money that can help out help the wildlife and the fisheries and uh, there's a lot of there's a it's a big uh, industry right now fishing we got a lot of people coming to Tennessee fishing and a lot of them fish for stripers so but we suppose we appreciate your support and we do uh, support this recommendation from Fr Frank for the limited restrictions thank you Thank you, Mr. James, and I, I really appreciate that you got in the area that I serve, and so I appreciate that input a lot. Thank you. Any other comments from the public? Great. With that, um, members, we've still got a couple of proposals under the Fisheries Committee, but if it's all right, I'd like to request from Chairman Cook if we take a 10, 15 minute break. Let everybody tend yeah, to their let's, business. Let's really get started. 305, can we? Let's 305, start 305, folks. Don't let the chairman down.